Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, which in short means that cryptography plays a huge role in how monetary information is retained and how transactions are performed. And if you've looked into how Bitcoin makes sure that people are spending their own money and not someone else's, you've probably come across what is called the Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Algorithm, or the ECDSA. But what is an elliptic curve and how can we use a geometric object to do cryptography, which usually involves loads of number theory and algebra. We're going to focus on the arithmetic of an elliptic curve, so more of the algebra side of things, because that's one of the rudiments of any crypto system is how you're transforming what you're encoding. We should probably go over what an elliptic curve is. In general, elliptic curves are derived from cubic curves, or things that are described by this equation, for some coefficients a, b, c, d, e, f, g, h, i, and j. To reiterate, i here is not the square root of negative 1, it's just some real number. For example, a cubic curve could look like this one, which is kind of a mess, or it could look more tame like this one does. An elliptic curve is a cubic curve that has special properties. That is, it's non-singular, so it doesn't intersect itself or have any cusps like these two do, and it's projective, which means something mathematically, but we're not going to focus on it that much. It'll come up later on, but we're just going to leave that there for now. And it is also an abelian variety, or abelian variety. So there is a way to define an operation of points on the curve similar to that of addition or multiplication on the real numbers. Before we jump into the operation, we're going to simplify what we're working with by assuming that there is a rational point on the curve. This is a huge assumption, but it's going to be important for most of the things that we do. One such simplification that arises from this assumption is the Weierstrass normal form, which allows us to write elliptic curves in the form y squared equals x cubed plus ax squared plus bx plus c for some constants a, b, and c. And there are finitely many exceptions to our ability to do this for a curve that has a rational point. So moving on to illustrate addition, let's go ahead and look at an example curve. Take y squared equals x cubed plus 2x squared plus 2x plus 4, which looks something like this, and pick two points on the curve, call them a and b. The composition of these points, A star B, which is not the addition, is the point where the line between them hits the curve a third time. Now, the elliptic curve addition of the two points A and B is defined as the reflection of their composition, A star B, across the x-axis. We know that the reflection across the x-axis is on the curve because in Weierstrass normal form, we have equality with y squared which means the curve is symmetric across the x-axis. Now, we need to make sure addition makes sense. What I mean by that is that there needs to be an identity element, and there need to be inverses for each point on the curve that take you back to that identity element. We should also be able to add things to themselves, which isn't entirely obvious at this point. So let's start off by tackling the identity. Often, the point that resembles the identity is referred to as the point at infinity. And the presence of this point on the curve is the intuition behind what it means for the curve to be projective. That is, that it lives in the projective plane. For our purposes, we're not going to go into too much detail here. But for our curves, a line through the point at infinity and a point on the curve is just a vertical line. So taking A star, the point at infinity, gives the reflection of A across the x-axis and then taking the reflection across the x-axis again returns us to A. So the point at infinity does work. Now, in order to get the point at infinity, that is, in order to find inverses, we just take the reflection across the x-axis of some point. Since this line only hits the real curve twice, it hits a third time at the point at infinity. And the reflection of the point at infinity across the x-axis is just itself. Lastly, for adding a point to itself or doubling a point, we will use the tangent line to the curve at that point, which intersects it with multiplicity 2. So A star with itself is the third point that is hit by the tangent line, and thus we can find A plus A. Now this is all great, but what does this look like algebraically? For a curve of the form y squared equals x cubed plus ax squared plus bx plus c, 
and two points A equals X1, Y1, and B equals X2, Y2, we can determine the line between them. And then substituting this equation for the line between them into the equation for the curve gives this expression, which is a cubic with three zeros at the X values where the line intersects with the curve. So it may be written in this factored form as well. Using a root coefficient relationship, we can determine that a minus the slope squared is equal to the sum of the negative x-coordinates of the three points of intersection. And we can thus solve for our desired x-coordinate and use the x-coordinate to get our y-coordinate. If that seemed really involved, it is. It's one of the reasons that elliptic curves are so useful as the algebraic operations are so computationally intensive. To illustrate this more, the doubling formula, which only gives the x-coordinate, is given by the following. Okay, so now we know a bit of math that is at work behind elliptic curve arithmetic, so it is plausible that one may also do cryptography with these curves. However, much of the time we work with modular arithmetic on elliptic curves. This often makes it easier to deal with and store these computationally intensive operations. When we say modular, we're looking at a curve with coefficients in what's called f sub p. That is, if p is prime, then the finite field of p elements, f sub p, is an algebraic structure which has all the operations that you enjoy from algebra on the real numbers, so multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction all make sense. The standards for efficient cryptography define an elliptic curve domain as a sextuple, t equals p, a, b, g, n, h, where p is a prime that specifies the field, a and b specify the curve y squared is equal module p to x cubed plus ax plus b. g is a point on this curve with coordinates in the finite field. n is what's called the order of g, which is the smallest multiple of g that yields the identity element. And h is the ratio of the number of possible g's one could have chosen divided by n. Bitcoin uses the elliptic curve domain with p is equal to 2 to the 256th minus 2 to the 32nd minus 2 to the 9th minus 2 to the 8th minus 2 to the 7th minus 2 to the 6th minus 2 to the 4th minus 1 a equal to 0 and b equal to 7. For this curve, the standards for efficient cryptography present a base point g with a non-compressed representation in 130 hexadecimal digits. And this base point has an order that is represented by 64 hexadecimal digits. So it's safe to assume that these are pretty large numbers at play. So it's, it's pretty clear that these things are computationally a mess. To illustrate what this modular arithmetic does to our previous geometric interpretation of elliptic curves, we're going to look at the same curve as the Bitcoin curve, but with P equals 11 and a base point of 2, 2. We get this picture. Geometrically here, addition is performed in the same way. There's just a lack of continuity because our axes are no longer real lines but integer values. And we wrap around when we follow a line through two points. For example, the point 29 plus the point 310 is equal to the point 78 in this example. It can be a bit harder to think about tangent lines in this new interpretation of our curve, but the calculation of a tangent line still makes sense. So adding 2, 2 to itself over and over again, we get the following multiples of 2, 2. And that gives us an n of 4. And since there are 11 points on the curve over f11, we have a cofactor h of 11 over 4. And that gives you the full description of the elliptic curve domain here. Hopefully this has illustrated how computationally intensive elliptic curve arithmetic can be which is one of the reasons it's such a great candidate for use in a crypto system. That is, it's really nice because the forward process, although computationally intensive, is well understood, but the reverse process can be a lot more difficult to get at, especially when you're working modulo a prime. The standards for efficient cryptography discusses the strength of these curves and provides recommended elliptic curve domains for different bit strengths amongst other conditions. And so I've left, left a link to a few of their documents below. I've also left a link to a applet that kind of like goes through elliptic curve addition, both on the real line and for a finite field. And it's a really cool just 
visualization of what's going on if you're not up for hand drawing these things. Anyhow, that's all I wanted to get through today. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more mathematics videos too. As always, I am Nathan, this is Chalk, and I will see you next time.